Cheetah Grow Facebook Live. Today is April the 12th, 2020, the first Easter Sunday of its kind in my lifetime, and we hope that you're having a good day today. I looked out just a few moments ago. It was cloudy earlier, but the uh, sun was shining, so that makes you feel better anyway. Uh, again, we uh, welcome you to this Resurrection Sunday, and, and without uh, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we have no hope. There is no Christian faith without that resurrection. We're so thankful for that resurrection day. Uh, and today we're going to look at some of the proof for the resurrection. I can, again, I just want to rem remind you to be in prayer. Be in prayer for our nation, for our president, vice president, all of our leadership, uh, governor and, uh, and our local uh, governors and, and local governments as well. Be in prayer for them, and we need they, they need your prayers. Be in prayer for your churches. Be in prayer for the sick, those that affected by and infected by this virus. Be in prayer for them, and pray that God will lift up this virus today. Today would be the last days of its increasing, and it would, from this point on, be de decreasing. Uh, continue to pray uh, again uh, for not only our leaders in our church, but we pray for those that are shut-ins, especially those in nursing homes and, and assisted living homes. Remember them in prayer and, and lift them up. Right now, it's hard on everybody, and, and uh, I've never seen an Easter like this in my lifetime, uh, and I would dare say neither have you. But we need to, to lift this up in prayer, and it's my prayer uh, that this would turn, this uh, uh, pandemic would turn around and it would be a great revival of moving across our land as we've seen on Facebook and other places. Uh, more things about the gospel this weekend and more things about the resurre resurrected Christ. We need to just lift up and pray for revival across our land. Uh, again, uh, just remind you to... Uh, uh, if you would like to give to Cedar Grove, our people, uh, especially that give their tithes and offerings, encourage you to give to cedargrovebaptist.com, uh, uh, www.cedargrovebaptist.com, and you can click on online giving or send it to Cedar Grove Baptist 1289 Cedar Road, Stamping Ground, Kentucky 40379. Encourage you to give, and don't forget. Uh, that this Wednesday night we will be back with you at 6 o'clock Wednesday evening uh, with a continued study on the book of 1 John. We'll continue in chapter 2 of 1 John. Today we'd like if you to have your Bibles if you would turn to what is commonly called the resurrection chapter uh, in the Bible, and that's 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If you will be turning there in chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, uh, we want to read some passages there and give you some thoughts concerning the resurrection. In our Christian faith, everything about our faith hinges on the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. He is our hope, and He is our only hope. Uh, and in Him we place our hope of the resurrection of, of life, that one day we will be with Him in eternity. You found 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Again, just put your finger in your Bible and, and let's day, say our confession this Sunday morning, especially this Sunday morning. It's on Easter Sunday, and we thank God for it. This is our confession. This is my Bible. It is a holy, inspired Word of God. It is the truth of God without any error. It tells me what to believe and what not to believe, how to behave and how not to behave. I am what it says that I am. I can do what it says I can do. I have what it says I have. I count it so in Jesus' name. And I pray today in your heart you'll say amen and amen to that truth. Today, if you'll uh, read along with me, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I'm going to begin in verse 3, and you read along with me, please. And the scripture says the following. Paul writing says, For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and he arose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas or Peter, then by the twelve, 
And after that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remains to the present, but some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen by me also as one born out of due time. Skip down to verse 12, if you will, please. And let's continue this study of the resurrection. And that day, uh, if you need to remember that the book of 1 Corinthians is a powerful book, but it was written for the purpose of correcting some uh, uh, false teachings in the church. So he begins in verse 12 and says, Now if Christ be preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if, Christ, but if there is no resurrection from the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Yes, we, have found, we are found uh, false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most pitiable. But now Christ is risen from the dead and become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Now, Holy Spirit, we pray you'll come and teach us and guide us in your truth. And Father, open hearts and minds of those that are listening today that there might be some that would hear and maybe for the first time your spirit speak to their heart and draw them out into yourself. Others of us who know you as our Lord and Savior, may we be encouraged in our faith and more bold in our faith than ever before and proclaim the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Paul says in our text that if there is no resurrection, our faith is futile or empty, vain, void worthless. In, in other words, if Christ did not raise from the grave, we have no hope at all. For there is no one else to turn to in all the world's religions. Uh, find one that has uh, come up from the grave. All of them are dead. And if Christ be not risen, he would be just like one of them. But he concludes that Christ is risen from the dead. And therefore Paul and all the other apostles affirm that Jesus did raise from the dead and that he is the first fruits from the dead and we are to follow him in due season, that is, in our turn. But the resurrection of Jesus is a historical event verified by physical evidence, first of all, by physical evidence. In the book of John, when the, the, the message was told to the apostles in the upper room there by the women, uh, that, uh, that, that the angel had said, he's not here, he is risen. And they began to run. John and Peter ran off to the grave. And it says here in verse 5 through 7 and John 20, and he, that is John, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes laying there, yet he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb and he saw the linen clothes laying there and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but folded together in a place by itself. These two witnesses witnessed the empty tomb where Jesus had been laid that first Easter morning. The grave claws were empty. In other words, they had uh, put a wrapping around Jesus, that linen cloth around Jesus, and wrapped him up as was the custom of that day. They wrapped him up in that linen clothes and so that he was basically tied up in there. He could not get out on his own, uh, on his own uh, physical ability. But that linen clothes was empty. 
uh, he didn't uh, unwrap it. He just disappeared out of it. And then the handkerchief that was over his face was folded. And by saying now uh, that it, it has ended, it's over, it's finished. And so Peter and John witnessed the same things that morning. And the physical evidence was that the grave was empty and the grave claws were gone and were empty. And so uh, these were eyewitnesses. Not only was there physical evidence, but then there were eyewitnesses. Notice what Paul said in this first uh, part of this chapter. He said in verse 5, 6, 7, and 8, he was seen. Paul mentions five appearances, or six appearances actually, uh, here in this text. Notice verse 5, seen first of Peter, and then the apostles. That's two right there. And verse, uh, uh, verse 6, the 500 at one time. Uh, listen, 500 people is not going to have the same vision or illusion at the same time. 500 people saw him at one time. And then verse 7, James. And then also in verse 7, then, then the other apostles. And then in verse 8, last of all, by Paul. But Paul didn't mention all of them. There are others recorded in the Gospels. For example, Mary Magdalene and the other ladies that went to the tomb that day to anoint his body. Uh, the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, uh, when Jesus appeared and walked with them until he broke the bread, they didn't. their eyes were open to where they would know it was him. Uh, and then that evening, the resurrection day evening, that's why it's important to go to Sunday night church, folks. Uh, you might miss something. All the apostles, 10 of the apostles were there, but Thomas was missing. And Thomas said, I won't believe unless I can feel the nail prints in his hand and put my hand in his side. And, and the, the next Sunday night, he appeared again, and Thomas is in the presence, and he says, Thomas, uh, reach out your hand and touch me. And so, uh, so, all, uh, so there were those appearances. Not only were there those appearances in the upper room and Tom, while Thomas was there, but then uh, all the apostles were present at that time. Uh, Jesus appeared on the Sea of Galilee. Uh, remember in the Gospel of John, uh, he appeared on the Sea of Galilee and, and Peter had said, I'm going to go fish and the others went with him and, and, uh, and Jesus calls out from the bank, do you have any food? Have you caught anything? And they said, no. He says, cast your net on the other side and they brought in a haul of 153 great fishes, large fishes and uh, they began to realize and Peter swam to shore and knelt down before the Lord. That's when the Lord ask him and told him, do you love me? And three times, and he had to confess him three times as he had denied him three times. Also, if you look in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter one, Paul, Luke had written this and in verse, the last part of verse two, he says, and he, speaking of Christ through the Holy Spirit, has, has given commandment to the apostles whom he, had. and then also the conduct of the enemies how they lied and told the, uh, the guards that they paid them a bribe, bribe to uh, tell them to tell uh, that the disciples came and stole him away and how they tried to cover up the whole matter and, uh, and spread the gospel, uh, gossip, gossip uh, throughout the community. So the resurrection of Jesus was not only uh, a, a event of, of um, uh, verified by historical event, uh, but it's also uh, the resurrection of Jesus was a physical event. See, there was in the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. It was a physical body that rose from the grave. He ate with them that evening, uh, resurrection day. He says, do you have any fish? And they gave him uh, anything to eat, and they gave him a piece of boiled fish, and he ate it in front of them. He walked with them on the road there to Emmaus. He cooked for them on the Sea of Tiberias in, John, in John's Gospel, and uh, and I always like to say that he prepared breakfast for them after they caught the 153 fishes. Uh, he, he could be touched. Uh, reach forth your hand, he said to Thomas, and touch me. Uh, it was a physical event, uh, and, and, and uh, Thomas was told to touch him. Uh, it was a bodily resurrection. It was a vi victorious event. You see, it, it gained victory over death and the grave. In 1 Corinthians 15, 55, we read the following. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, Hades, where is your victory? 
The sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. It guarantees our, uh, our victory over sin and Satan. And not just his, but our victory over sin and Satan. The Romans eight or 6 verse 8 says this, If we died with Christ, we believe we shall also live with Christ. But if, in verse 11, chapter 8 in verse 11 says, But if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. The Holy Spirit lives within us and gives us victory over sin and over Satan in our lives. It, it, it establishes the authority of his teaching. Think about this for a moment. Uh, he, he did what he said he was going to do. He established his authority. Uh, in other words, Jesus said he would raise from the dead. He had told him, uh, the uh, disciples that beforehand. Even the Jewish leaders knew what he had said because they sent the guard to the tomb because they said he said he would rise again on the third day. And so they put the guard over the tomb. Uh, it proved that Jesus was who he said he was. Romans 1 verse 4 says, And declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. You know, we sing much about Christmas and, and, uh, and uh, about Jesus being born, the Son of God being born. But it wasn't the virgin birth that proved who he was. It was his resurrection that proved who he was. He had established his authority and his teaching because all he said was true. When he came out of the grave, he came out victorious. It also confirms his claims about himself. When he was asked plainly by the high priest in his mock trial before the Sanhedrin, he says, I put, the high priest said to him, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. And he replied, verse 64, and this is Matthew 26, 64, It is as you said. Nevertheless, I say to you, afterward you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming in heaven, coming in the clouds of heaven. Listen, folks, Jesus is who he said he was. He confirmed uh, his claims about himself. It was a bodily resurrection. It was physical evidence, and it was a guarantee of victory. It showed God's approval for his sacrifice for our sins. Once you think about this for a moment, on the Day of Atonement in the Old Testament, if you read concerning the tabernacle in the wilderness, on the Day of Atonement, the high priest was to take the blood of the atoning lamb, and you would, he would take that blood, and he walked by a place called the laver, uh, or it really was a big bowl of water uh, with spouts, as it were, and he washed his hands, and he washed his feet. He picked up that blood, he walked into the holy place, and as he walked through the curtains on the, from the uh, court uh, into the holy place, there set on his one hand was the seven golden candlesticks, because Jesus is the light of the world. And there on the other hand was the table of shoe bread because Jesus is the bread of life. And there before him, right in front of the uh, veil uh, that goes into the Holy of Holies, uh, there, that, there was the table of incense because the prayers of intercession are ever rising up and he's our great intercessor and, and the Holy Spirit ever lives and intercedes for us. And as you move the curtain back, the veil back, and he put the blood on the mercy seat, he sprinkled the blood on the mercy seat, and there it was accepted by God as a sacrifice. But oh, wait a minute, if you offered up a, 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 a lame uh, sacrifice, that blood wouldn't be accepted. If you offered a blind one, that blood, it had to be a perfect sacrifice. And they would, uh, the tradition says that they would tie a rope either around the, the high priest's foot or around his waist. So if that sacrifice was not accepted, that blood was not accepted on the mercy seat, God would strike the high priest dead. But the very fact that he walked out of the holy place, the people would rejoice because God accepted the blood of the atoning sacrifice. And Jesus came out of the grave victorious because God in heaven accepted his sacrifice. He gave him 
new life. He gave him his life back. And so, uh, so uh, we have the, that it showed God's approval on his sacrifice. God accepted his blood sacrifice, his atoning sacrifice. He is our mercy seat, the propitiation for our sins. And God accepted that sacrifice on our behalf. And then his resurrection assures us of the resurrection of the saints. It is promised in the scriptures. Uh, John uh, chapter 5 and verse 21, Jesus said the following, uh, For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom he will. I want you to listen to this. It was believed and foretold in the Old Testament by the prophets. Moses spoke of the coming of Jesus, said another one's coming like unto me, and he will, uh, him you will hear, you will listen to. And then God gave to Moses all the symbolic things that were said in the temple that all were pictures and symbols of Christ and his work and his, uh, his fulfillment of his work. That Job, I like to read you what Job said. Uh, Job said it this way in Job 20, in verse 25, he says, For I know my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at last on the earth, and after my skin is destroyed. This I know, that in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold and not another. Now my heart yearns within me. Oh, Job looked for a resurrection. It was prophesied and promised to the, uh, to the, uh, to the saints of God. And then uh, David talked about it. He would not see his, his uh, uh, Savior see corruption. He would not see corruption. He prophesied of the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, corruption sets in after three days. Jesus rose that third morning. Isaiah talked about it. We talk about Isaiah in 53 as a picture of, of uh, Christ's death and the suffering for our sins. And, and he was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities and so forth. But notice down in verse 10, listen to what he says. It says, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him and he put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, that's what Jesus died in our place. But listen to the rest of this verse. And he shall see his seed. He shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Oh, Jesus died, was buried, and then he said it was his will that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. A will does not go into effect until a person dies. When Jesus died, his will into effect, he arose from the grave and he is now the mediator for the saints of God. He is now the executive of his own will and he is carrying it out today. Praise God, he's carrying it out today. Well, I done lost my place, but, uh, but uh, uh, it was believed by, by the apostles. It was uh, not just by the Old Testament, but it's believed by the apostles. We shared with you some of those, but uh, who, who would die for something that you knew wasn't true? Who would give their life for something they knew was a lie? And yet all the apostles, with the exception of John the Revelator, all the apostles, including Paul, died martyred deaths for their faith. John was boiled in oil and God gave him life because he wasn't done with John yet. And John the Revelator wrote on the Isle of Patmos the book of Revelation. Peter said it this way in John or in Acts chapter 4 and verse 10. He said, let it be known to you all. And I say that to you today. Let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. By him, this man stands before you whole. If you remember the story where Peter and John were going into the beautiful temple by the beautiful gate, and the man asked for alms, and Peter said, it's silver and gold, I have none, but such as I have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. And he rose up, and he leaped in joy, and, and went into the temple area, rejoicing, and called a whole crowd together. There were 5,000 saved that day, by the way. But nevertheless, He's saying it was because Jesus died, was buried, and rose, and it was the power of the resurrection that gave life 
but this man today. That's what he was saying. It was believed by the early church. If you read First and Second Thessalonians, there's eight chapters total in those two books. And if I'm not mistaken, I think there's only one chapter in one of the books. I believe it's uh, First, First Thessalonians, but there's one chapter where it doesn't mention something about the Lord's coming back, the Lord's return. The res uh, and, and our returning unto him. It will be the resurrection of the saints in, uh, in Christ. Uh, it will be a physical, spiritual thing. I mean, it's going, to be, it's going to be receiving a new body like unto our Lord's body. It will be joining our new body with our spirit uh, wherein we will live throughout all eternity. It will be a translation for some that are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord. And they will be changed in a moment, in an instant, in a twinkling of the eye, of the, eye the Bible says. They'll be changed from from the corruptible to the incorruptible, from the mortal to the immortal. Uh, they'll be changed in an a, in a instant and, be, uh, and rise to meet the Lord in the air. From this sin-cursed body uh, that is destined to die to a new eternal body that is likened to the Lord that will live forever. And it will be a meeting with the Lord in the air. Wouldn't that be a, oh, that's going to be a great day. When we meet the Lord in the air at his coming and we forever will be with the Lord. Let me read you a portion of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 13. And I hope it will add comfort to you this day on this Resurrection Sunday. Listen to what Paul said. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those that have fallen asleep, those who have died, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For we say this to you by the word of the Lord. In other words, this was revelation to Paul. This is the word of the Lord that we who are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those which are, who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the shout and the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together uh, with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. Ladies and gentlemen, what a day that will be when we see Jesus and rise with him. His resurrection guarantees our resurrection at his coming. You see, this is his promise. I will give unto them everlasting life and they shall never perish. He said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. But I go and prepare a place for you that where I am, there you may be also. And the way you know, and, and, the, and I, where I go, you know, and, and the way you know. And Thomas said, I don't, we don't know where you're going. How do we know the way? And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Ladies and gentlemen, I bid you our hope is in Christ. This is our hope. And it's guaranteed by the seal of the Holy Spirit. You say, oh, you're just, you're just making this stuff up. It's all in your head, you know, and all this stuff. No, no, no. God gave us an earnest of the Spirit. He gave us a down payment of what it shall be someday. He gave us a down payment when he put the Holy Spirit in those who believe. And he puts that Holy Spirit in your heart. And when you trust him as your Lord and Savior, he puts the Holy Spirit in you. And you say, well, how do I know if the Holy Spirit's in you? Because the things I once loved, I now hate. Because God changes us from the inside out. Uh, you, nobody will maybe notice the outside appearance of us being changed, but they'll certainly notice our actions being changed, our words that come out of our mouth. We got a man in our church that says, hey, he used to make up words and say curse words. And, and he says, but, but God took it from him at the moment that he trusted Christ and said, this is our hope. This is the guarantee of the Holy Spirit that convicts you when you sin, when you do things wrong. And, and we're commanded not to grieve the Holy Spirit because, man, God deals with his own children. He don't do, you say, well, how can the world go on like it is? God don't whip the Satan's kids. 
He, but he does chasten his own. And I just challenge you today to receive this promise that he's given to us. This is our hope, guaranteed by the seal of the Holy Spirit of promise that is within us. We're not here today to celebrate the dead. But we are here because of the hope of life that we have in Christ Jesus. Because he lives, we can live also. Do you know him today? Has there ever been a time in your life when you repented of your sins and asked Jesus to be Lord of your life? The Bible says, with the heart man believes unto righteousness. And the heart is not a physical heart. It's the center of your being, who you really are. You believe or put your faith and trust and reliance upon Jesus Christ, that he died for our sins, that he was buried and he arose again. You believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. You can confess it with your mouth. Confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior today. To all you that are Christians today that are listening to this, I want to give you a little word of encouragement found over in the book of Titus chapter 2. In verse 13, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Are you looking today? Lift up your eyes and look into the hills from whence come our help. Ladies and gentlemen, I challenge you today. Put your faith and trust in Christ. Do you have that hope today? Do you know him today? Would you repent of your sins and ask Jesus to be Lord of your life today? I hope you will. And this will be the greatest resurrection in your life when you make Jesus Lord. I trust you have a glorious day. I trust that you will re receive Christ if you don't know him. And if you do know him, you'll rejoice in the glory, looking for and hastening until the day of his return. God bless you. Have a glorious day. Amen.